Am I on? Yeah, I think on. I'm on. OK, good. Uh, so welcome to uh, deep dive into Windows configuration management with Ansible. Oh, this is my only slide. Uh, my name is uh, Tron Hinnanes. I work for a Norwegian TV broadcast company called Riksteva. That's not important right now. Uh, we're hiring. That's also not important right now. So if you want to move to Oslo, then I guess I don't even know which email to point to at, so I don't know why I said that. Anyway. <laughs> but the w uh, no, no, we have an office in Poland, so it's it's more and more English. Our confluence is a mess of at least three languages, so that's fine. You're good. Um, so what I'm uh, what I'm going to do today is that um, there's a lot of interest in 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 Ansible. It's kind of ramping up for some reason, and and what I wanted to do was instead of standing here talking to you about why one product may be better than the other or whatever, I thought I'd just, given that you guys are probably well versed in PowerShell, I thought I'd just spend 45 minutes showing you how Ansible and PowerShell kind of works together. So that's the talk. So I'm not going to try and convince you to go throw away your pool servers or your chef cookbooks or anything. I just, I'm going to show you how this works, basically. Friendly and simple as that. If you have questions, fire them away. Uh, this repo is, is oh, uh, it's uh, in, in GitHub, so uh, this is probably the least advanced Ansible code you'll find on the internet. But if you want to pull it down and do whatever with it, then uh, be my guest. Um, so having said that, how many have used or tried Ansible or in any way touched it? A couple. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, then um, my work is done. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with, uh, with the super basic stuff. Uh, I'm going to plus that up a little bit. So um, when you write Ansible kind of configurations, you do that in so-called playbooks. So a playbook uh, contains a set of plays, and each play contains a set of tasks. And you execute tasks against what we call target nodes. Um, Ansible is not agent-based. It has a so-called control node that reaches out to an inventory. Uh, so you need to tell Ansible which servers it should work against. Uh, and here in my demo, I just use a simple text file. In real-life production, you would typically have something that generates uh, a JSON, such a web, web service or whatever. So you get like a live view of what your environment is. So that if you spin up and down nodes, then that gets reflected in your inventory. But you can also, so anything that's able to produce a JSON file can be used as an inventory. Uh, right here, I'm just using a super simple text file. So I can maybe show, show that first. Uh, so this is my Ansible inventory. Uh, and it has a couple of important bits and pieces. Um, it has this concept of uh, grouping. So here I have uh, a, an all group, which is empty. But then I say that I have two children. I have web servers and app servers. So they kind of uh, belong inside my all group. Uh, and then I have a bunch of, of variables that, uh, that's attached to my all group, which means that they're also implicitly attached to the subgroups of that. So it kind of cascades down. Um, this one is important because it tells us that the target node is a Windows node instead of a Linux node. If I said SSH or nothing here, it would just assume that it was a Linux node and try to, to uh, uh, SSH in. So this is what you need to kind of, so that, that's all it takes for you to talk to Windows instead of Linux. There's no extra module or anything magic. You just tell it which, which connection, connection to use. So WinRM, and then I'm using Ansible port 5986, which is WinRM's SSL port. And then I'm doing the thing that you guys definitely should not be doing in production. I'm just using a clear text password, which is the local admin user. So if you do that in production, I will come and kick you in the shit. Uh, and the last one is basically that we are allowing a non-trusted uh, WinRM certificate. So this is, it's about as easy as you can get in terms of getting Ansible up and running and talking to, to nodes. It's not the way you should be doing it in production. 
Ansible, Ansible supports Kerberos. I think you can also use client certificates against uh, WinRM's uh, SSL cert. So, so you, have, you have the same options from Ansible as you do from regular PowerShell remoting. So you should definitely use, use that. Um, so yeah, so I have two groups here, web servers and app servers. I haven't decided if I should sit or stand yet, but I'm, I'm going to stand for now. Um, so the first thing we can do is to execute this uh, test playbook. And it looks like this. Um, so I start with a name, and that can be anything. And the host is basically who I want to send this stuff to. So that's one of my groups. So here I'm using all, which contains both the app servers and the web servers I defined. So this stuff goes out to everyone. Uh, and then I have a list of tasks. Uh, the first one uses the win feature Ansible module to simply install the talent client. The next one uses the win service Ansible module uh, to just make sure that the Prince Puller is, is started. Um, so let's just run that and marvel at its magic. Uh, here, I think. Uh, no. Here, I think. Yes. So the first thing Ansible does, uh, gathering facts, it's, it's uh, logging on to the target node and gathers a bunch of stuff. It gets to know its IP address, its actual name, a lot, all of the environment variables. And you can also inject custom scripts there. So if you want to know, for example, the list of software installed on a node, that's just an extra PowerShell uh, snippet you can add in, and that gets reported back. So you get a really rich like, object of metadata about your host that you can use in, in the logic later on. Uh, and then the next thing that happens is that it uses the, the win feature uh, module to uh, make sure that the Telnet client is, is present. Uh, so that reported a change. That meant that, that it was originally missing, but Ansible corrected that. Um, and then we used the win service module to make sure that the principle was running. That was already OK, so no change done. So if I rerun this, um, I shouldn't have any change at all. Yay, config management. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's, that's about as simple as you can go. Um, and you can also limit down uh, the host you want to run against. So this playbook is still targeting the all group. But here I say, hey, I just want you to talk to the web servers, um, not, not the all group. Um, so if I use this, you should see that it just cuts down the list of targets to a single node. Yeah. Um, and we also have uh, we also have tags, and we are internally we're using tags a lot because we have so rich playbooks that we don't often like run the entire thing from start to end. So you can use tags to say that hey, uh, for example, if you have both software installation and service configuration in the same playbook, you can just tag your task so that you can, hey, today I just want to run the software installation part or the service configuration part. So why wouldn't you build that into another playbook that combined both but you yeah, that's a good question. And the question was, why don't you just separate them out? And, and we. Um, we have this philosophy because we went through a couple of iterations on how we organize playbooks internally. But we, we, or I, I guess, uh, came to the decision that we wanted one. We wanted to be able to do one playbook that would just do everything. And then you can you can do different things. You can include another playbook based on logic. So we could have we could have done that a different way, definitely. Uh, but tags is is a fairly easy way to kind of. Uh, do some selection in terms of what you want to do, but but you have you have a ton of other options as well. So definitely, um, yeah. So again, if I run this guy, then you will see that it only does the service config. I think it still gathers facts, 
And if you tag things with always, they will always run regardless of the tags you use. Um, so yeah, super simple. Uh, then, um, Ansible is, um, what I like with Ansible is that it has a really strong variable uh, kind of, the idea of variables is very strongly used in Ansible. Pretty comparable to PowerShell, I guess. What would PowerShell be without the dollar sign, right? It wouldn't be that much fun. Um, so, like I said, what Ansible does when it first talks to uh, talks to a server is to um, run a module called setup, which basically queries uh, queries the the VM for a bunch of things. And all of these, this is just a JSON object, and you can use every single one of these variables as logic inside your playbook. So you can, for example, say, hey, if it's, uh, let's say, if PowerShell version is five, then good. But if it's not five, then update it to version five. So you can, so you can do stuff like that. Uh, yes, you can use, um, Ansible has a templating agent called Jinja2, which is a Python, uh, Python templating agent. And you also have a couple of built-in lookup functions. Uh, so it has, for example, a function to convert, uh, to get the, what's a good example? Yeah, to get like the Windows PS drive out of a path. So you have a bunch of helper function. It's super easy to write your own as well. So, so yeah, you can do pretty, pretty rich logic in there. Um, and, and there's a bunch of helper modules around kind of manipulating JSON objects as well. So yeah, it's pretty, it pre it's pretty rich. And like I said, you can also inject your own custom PowerShell to kind of make it return more stuff. Um, so, uh, so now that I, uh, what was I thinking here? Yeah. So let me just switch. We're done with the basics now. We're into the more advanced. Um, so this facts playbook uh, uses that one of those variables, and the variable I use is Ansible host name. So the way you use variables with Ansible is a double bracket on each sign. So instead of a dollar sign, you use double bracket. And that comes from this Jinja2 templating agent that's kind of driving the variable stuff. Um, so that should output no. Why? No, that's never going to work, is it? But I can do tasks name output it and then I can do uh, debug and I can say message sorry about that I don't know what I was thinking now let's see output it yeah that doesn't matter it's just the name but message oh I have a double So um, Ansible uses YAML, um, and YAML is comparable to JSON. It's just made so that you don't have to uh, go crazy with columns and quotes and stuff. Uh, it, it takes a little bit of time to get used to it, but once you do, I, I, found it, I find it way easier to write a, a YAML file than a JSON file. And if you use VS Code, it has really good plugins that help you kind of validate your YAML stuff as well. Mm. So what I wanted to show here that was just that I'm using the one of the variables, which is Ansible host name, to kind of just print print back the, the host name of, of each server, basically. Uh, yeah, and then um, so the next thing is conditionals. Um, so this is an example of me having a. Um, uh, having a like a cross-platform playbook where I basically do some logic based on based on the operating system. So here I say if this is a Windows node, I'll just use the Win feature module to install the client, uh, the Telnet client, 
And if it's a Debian node, I'll use the apt module to do the same thing. Uh, so, so that can be pretty powerful if you have stuff that you do on, on multiple platforms. And like I said, we, you can do whatever you want with, with this type of logic. Um, so yeah, I don't have a Debian node up and running here, but I can certainly run this one just for fun. Now, I think maybe, yeah, we already installed the Telnet client, so it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna uh, change anything. But here you can see that it's basically skipping my Windows nodes. Uh, and then conditional task result. Um, and this is uh, a way of taking a result of a previous task and using that to drive logic further down. So here I'm saying, hey, install this win feature, but register its result. So this will be an object that basically contains the outcome of the task. Um, it will have a changed object, which will be true and false. So based on that, I can, uh, I can take logic further down. So we use this a lot um, when we put packages on our server. If, uh, if this file got updated, then make sure that uh, you unzip it and replace a couple of files and then restart the service. But if it didn't change, then just leave everything alone. So you can do very almost transactional configuration management uh, where you kind of base yourself on, on the result of previous tasks. And you can also do failure handling. So you can say, hey, if this guy failed, then just shoot the server or reboot it <coughs> or do whatever. How does it handle multiple reboots? So like if you've got some features that need a reboot and then you want to do some software that needs a reboot. Yeah, so uh, the question was how does it handle reboot? Uh, Ansible has a win reboot module. And what it does is that, uh, um, I guess I wrote the first version of that and I stole the code from Steven Morawski's how to check WS man if it's really back up and running. And then, uh, and then um, Matt, who's kind of the Windows sensible dude inside of Red Hat, kind of made a more proper, proper version of that. So what we do is that we basically ask the node to reboot. And since we have a control no node, we can ping the, the WinRM endpoint and make sure that it's back up and then just continue where we left off. So all the, all the variables you've set and all the kind of context is still there. Uh, so, yeah, you just reboot whenever you want to. Nodes is, is a separate thread from the control node. Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. two servers you've got. So if one guy needs a reboot and the other doesn't, because maybe he's a bit further ahead, then the other, the other thread will carry on. Uh, the uh, so the question was, how does it handle, like, if one node needs to reboot and the other one doesn't? So what Ansible will do by default is do these one at a time. Uh, so it will wait here until all nodes have yeah. finished that one and then it will go on with this one. And that's how you can kind of shift back and forth between different targets. Say like, okay, set up IIS first here, and then the database, and then blah, blah, blah. But you can also set these freeform variables, which allows each node to just do whatever it wants, and then you don't care like about the sequence. So that's all very controllable. But by default, it will basically wait until all your nodes have either rebooted or confirmed that they didn't need to before it continues on. Yeah. Uh, did I already run this? Mm, no. So this is conditional task result. So what was this again? Yeah, it's just based on, uh, yeah, so here we check the result of that and then uh, we print some stuff, and then since we didn't change, we skipped it. So yeah, that's just logic. And I can show you a bonus track for both. So if you do, uh, the number of Vs basically controls the verbosity in Ansible. So you want a little bit more, you do V. And if you just want way too much, then you do five of them, I think is the max. Uh, but if you do one V, you'll actually get the JSON object. It'll print the JSON ob object that Ansible gets back. So here you see that it has an attribute called changed, which will be true-false. Um, and, 
uh, for example, on when you do uh, when you use the Windows feature module, there is a restart needed that will be true or false. So you can conditionally reboot your node after installing a Windows feature, stuff like that. So will the post Not by default, it's just on standard out, but you can set, uh, if you want to log it to a file, you can, uh, Ansible has this ansible.cfg file, which is uh, huge, or you can, <laughs> it, you can do a lot of weird stuff in it, but among others, you can give it, I think it's a directory, and they will pipe text there. And if you have passwords and stuff, you can also set this no log parameter, so if you have like a uh, standard variable called API key, then you can add API key to no log, and it will just make sure that that doesn't get written to the log. So you can do a little bit of tweaking of the logging. Uh, yes, so that was conditionals. Uh, is it good so far? Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm just saying a bunch of words. I have no idea what you guys are <laughs> thinking about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's a good sign. It means you're alive. Um, so uh, delegation is pretty cool in Ansible. Since we have this single control node that kind of serially talks to all the nodes, we can do uh, interesting stuff. We can, for example, say, okay, you are server A, but on behalf of you, I want to add you or remove you from the load balancer that's running somewhere else. Or I can say that, hey, server A is now online, so go to the domain controller and do some AD stuff there before you, uh, before you continue. Uh, so we don't use it too much, but we use it in, in a, couple of, a couple of cases. And it's, and it's yeah, it's pretty powerful. Um, for cloud stuff, when you provision stuff in Azure or Amazon, you typically do that from the control node, right? So you can do delegation, so after Azure has provisioned your VM, you can run some, maybe some ARM template to inject some extensions or whatever, and that happens on the control node, although it's, it's in, in the context of, of the target node. And with the context, I mean that you have that variable block that belongs to the target node, not the local host. What do you do when you need to customize, so say you install a service or a feature or something, and you want to customize it, you know you've got a set a load of keys, Maybe some policies and all the rest of it. Do you mix it with group policy, or do you go, "Hell no, I'm going to do all this natively"? Okay, there might not be a right answer to this. It might be, "What do you do when you do it?" Uh, so the question was, "Do we mix this with group policies or not?" Uh, no. If it's so not, if 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 it's not in Git, it doesn't get on the yeah, server. Yeah. So, yeah. so you take anything that, say, for example, is would normally be applied with group policy, you'll do that natively on the on the device. Yeah. I would rather use Ansible to inject yeah. registry settings yeah, yeah. than do it in group policy, definitely. Uh, so yeah, delegation. Uh, this is my delegation playbook. So what I'm doing here is that I'm um, saying, oh, shoot, that shell module didn't work, did it? Oh, we'll try it again. Um, so what I'm doing here is that I'm saying, hey, print the Ansible host name, but delegate it that to the local host. So it will actually be the local host that, that prints it and not, the, and not the server. And it's kind of hard to see the difference in the console, but we'll try. Uh, Can you delegate Tron to a role? So, so if I've got, I don't know, five DNS servers, you can execute the same task on every server that has that role? Yeah. You can, yeah, definitely. Um, so you can, for example, say that uh, you can list Windows features against all your environments, and if the server has the DNS role, you can use the set fact module to say is DNS server, and then the next time you can execute some stuff against all nodes that has that flag or whatever. So it's. So I, I could add a new node and then say, right, go and register that as a DNS entry or whatever on every server. Oh, well. right. I, oh, yeah, definitely. That's a good, good use case for it. Yeah. Um, so what was I? This was three delegation. Uh, now, this might not work, but we'll give it a try.
No, see that? It didn't work. Oh, oh anyway, uh, I know why, but I'm not going to bother with that. The important thing here is the, I used the delegate to uh, function in a task, and you can say that, hey, on behalf of the PS day 2 server, execute this stuff on localhost. I know, right, I know why. It's because my localhost is a Linux machine. So that means that I can use the, the echo thing anyway. So this actually should work. So shell, the shell module in Ansible is just do this thing, either pure PowerShell on, on, uh, on Windows or just bash scripts on, on Linux. So it actually worked. So here you can see that it actually printed out that it, it delegated from this to this. Um, so yeah. And if I do this with verbose, I should actually be able to see the contents of that output. And it's not going to be very nice, but you can see here that this is that server's IP address, not localhost. And this server, this is that server's IP address and not localhost. So it works. Uh, right. Can you, so you, you've got a, a convoy. You did have a config there that was obviously only going to work on Windows. So can you put something in that config that basically says, if the control server is not Windows, bail, because I know that all of this is going to crap out? Um, so the question was, can you set something to control the control server's OS? So first and foremost, if you download Ansible and try and run it on Windows, that's not going to work. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's either Linux or no Linux. Uh, you can use Bash on Windows to run it, but that will, uh, the process will think it's running on, on Linux anyway. Uh, there is an Ansible fork that does work on Windows, but it's just, it's not in, in the, it's not in a master branch yet. There is some, the problem is how Ansible does multi-processing to kind of fork out to, to a bunch of servers at the same time. But, but they have it working on Windows, actually. So, so what I would do in that case, I would probably just the first task would be host call on localhost, and then just check what you are, basically. And then you can just fail from there. Yeah. Yeah. When a play that connects to um, a Windows device, because it's over WinRM, presumably the default shell is PowerShell. Is that the case? Uh, yeah. No, no, it's, it should be PowerShell. Okay. Yeah. So I think you can do just, yeah, you can just assume that it's able to run a PowerShell function like write host straight out of the box. So, okay, so it, you, you don't need to invoke PowerShell once mm -hmm. you connect? No, as far as I can remember, you don't. Okay, yeah. Void? Oh, okay, I didn't know. I have to check that out. So this is a bit more advanced. I might have to sit down for this one. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, so all of these, like, what we call Ansible modules, are essentially just PowerShell scripts that are included in the in the Ansible product, and it's super duper easy to create your own. Um, that said, though, you kind of have to think about. Uh, robustness maybe a lot more than if you just write a shell script to automate your coffee maker or whatever and you need to have robust change tracking so I guess you should maybe th think in the same terms as you would if you're writing a DSC module especially if you want to share it that you need to be able to handle kind of all possible outcomes 
Um, if you want to test stuff, Ansible also includes a, a tester, Ansible test, that you can basically assert that something did what you expected it to. Um, we've also seen people using test kitchens, Ansible driver, uh, to just stand up Vagrant and, and do tests and then destroy the environment. So you have some options there as well. But if uh, when, when, when we submit stuff to, to Ansible upstream, that's, that's using Ansible test in the background to verify that the code changes are, are working. Mm. So uh, before we start writing our own stuff, um, I'm going to just do a quick little dipping our toes into the Ansible uh, project uh, itself. Uh, so these are the modules that are Windows, or these are the Windows modules that, that come with Ansible. And as you can see, there's, there's a good bunch of them, um, but there's always, there's always room for more. And a lot of these have issues that um, might need you guys' capable hands to fix. So all, always, always uh, pull requests welcome. And it's a pretty including and friendly community. And especially around the Windows side of things, where we don't expect people to be like super well versed in open source software or whatever. So, if you just want to uh, see if you can fix something or talk to us or whatever, the, the Ansible GitHub space is a pretty friendly, friendly space to be in. Yeah. What are these modules typically written? Uh, all of these are PowerShell. Uh, on Linux, you can also use PowerShell if the Linux host has the PowerShell core thing that just works out of the box, um, but but we do some we do some stuff on Windows that makes it preferable to use PowerShell on, on Windows. And and what we do is basically when you when you execute uh, say the Win feature module on a Windows machine, we send this helper function in, and then we send the actual module in, and then we send the parameters in. And then they get executed and then deleted, basically. That's essentially what happens. Uh, uh, we do a lot of stuff to kind of make it go as fast as possible. So we do some connection reuse and stuff. But especially in earlier versions of the Windows support and Ansible, you could actually see the files get copied into temp directories and just executed. So it's not, it, that's, it's not more advanced than that. Um, but what I wanted to show was on uh, get it go. Ansible, Ansible. If you go to lib Ansible uh, module utils uh, PowerShell, so the module util legacy is the one I'm going to show because that's kind of how it's always been. So this this module has a lot of helper functions that you can just assume is is available when you write your your stuff. And um, the most important one is the get Ansible parameter. Uh, because this, it's, it's a helper function that kind of makes it easier for you to take, uh, at, or take parameters into your Ansible module in a, in a repeatable way. So for example, you have, uh, you can do fail if empty true. So if you set that and the user doesn't supply your required parameter, Ansible will take care of nice error messages and hey, you forgot this parameter and just exit out. So it almost works like uh, parameter validations in, in, inside of PowerShell functions, though it's not that advanced. So it's just a nice helper function to kind of allow you to, to, to do that without too much code. Um, so uh, also, uh, Ansible is controlled by a config file, which is normally global. But if you have an Ansible CFG file in your current directory, that gets used instead. So the way I tell Ansible to, hey, uh, my, my Ansible library of modules should include the current directory, is just to add set that to library. So PWD means the directory I'm in right now. So that's how I allow it to pick up the PowerShell file that I'm, that I'm having in the same directory. Um, so it's time for my first module. Um, so the first thing you need is these things. That's just some text parsing that makes 
PowerShell understand that you want to use that on top of the helper file that I just showed. So you actually need these two lines in. This stuff up here is just rubbish. You don't have to use it. Um, and then, uh, as you can see here, we use these uh, internal helper things to, uh, to kind of parse our parameters. So I expect the user, when he writes his playbooks, he or she, um, to, uh, to add a file name parameter and a file contents parameter. And if any of them are not specified, then we'll just fail it. Uh, so what this module does is that it creates a file on the C drive with the name of file name, and it fills it with the contents from this variable. So it's pretty advanced stuff. Thank you. Uh, and you can obviously buy it for a hefty amount of dollars after the session. Mm. And so the rest of this stuff you guys already know. You just uh, get the path and then do some stuff. And then again, here is the item potency, right? Because we need to be able to report back if we changed or not. And that needs to be super robust uh, for the whole thing to work. So here I basically test if this file exists. And if it doesn't, then I'll create it. Um, and then I'll also set that result object's changed attribute to true, which gets spit out back to the, to the user. And then you have to think about, OK, if the file exists, but it doesn't have the right content, then you also need to change, right? So even though the file existed, that's, that's a false. Then you get a true down here, because you had to update its contents. Um, and then you also use another helper function called exit.json to kind of uh, print that result object back. So this is a standard PS object or a hash table, I can't remember, uh, which just gets spit back into, into the Ansible kind of execution uh, by that helper function. So, so that's, that's pretty much all it takes for you to write your own, your own stuff. Um, so let's, uh, let's see if this works. So here I have my first module. I'm going to comment out one of the required parameters first, just to see what it, it, sh it should fail. Uh, let's see, are we in four? Uh, yeah. Yay. Um, so here I just said uh, this is a required parameter. So Ansible gives, generates this error message. And you can also override that. So if you want to give the user a better, like more help in terms of what he forgot, then, then you can totally override that. Um, so let's do it again with the, with the right thing. Yeah. Oh, my last demo actually failed it. Then I was redundant. But that's all right. So, um, so let's look at this thing, see what it did. So the first one created a test, test file txt with the contents of hello. And the ne next one created a computer name txt where I used a variable inside it. And then the next one used the host name as a file name and the Ansible distribution, so Windows or Linux as a content. And the last one just fails. So let's see how that works on the, on the thing. No. <laughs> I don't believe in updates. Um, so this is the computer name, which is filled it with the actual computer name. And then here I use the computer name as a, as a, ser uh, as a file name with its uh, addition inside. So yeah, that all works. So my module seems to seems to work fine. And obviously, if I run it again, it shouldn't actually change uh, anything at all, hopefully. So it looks nice and item potent. Uh, if this still reported change, then I would have to go back into my PowerShell module and figure out why. Um, so yeah. Uh, the last thing, since you guys ask so many questions that I'm way behind, is uh, 
uh, I want to talk about is, is DSC. We added uh, DSC support into Ansible uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, that's been living in a separate GitHub repo for, I don't know, about a year. And ever since Microsoft uh, introduced the uh, Invoke DSC resource, then we could easily kind of just create a light wrapper around it that allows Ansible to, to kind of use DSC. Um, I think it's a good option to do it this way if you want to use the kind of rich DSC ecosystem, but you maybe don't want to have this notion of a perfect target end state that your server is supposed to look like. Maybe you want to be more transactional or maybe you want to do things more dynamically, but you still want to use DSC resource to do it. Then I would say that Ansible is, is a good option. Uh, DSE resources are executing a bit slower than like a regular PowerShell script just because it's using the um, the thing that I can't remember the name of. The LCM. The LCM. Thank you. Um, but but it, it works really well and obviously there's a ton of, of really good uh, DSE resources both from Microsoft and from the community. We do a lot of DSE stuff when we configure our uh, IIS components because we found that the uh, kind of official DSC modules for IIS are better than, than what's included in a box in Ansible. Um, so this is uh, essentially a, or let me finish out. So what you need to do to, to uh, execute a DSC resource is to basically just get its properties. So this, this is what you do in literally in PowerShell. Um, I'm not sure if I have copy paste in that VM, but I'm willing to give it a try. Yes. So I'm using a group resource here. And um, so this is just me looking at which properties I have to send into that resource. So here you can say that uh, so group name is a required one, and the other ones are optional, it seems. And ensure probably defaults to present. So th that's, that's enough for us to kind of build and to kind of execute it with, uh, with Ansible. Uh, oh, and the DSC resource has to already exist on the node. Ansible doesn't like pull it down from the, from the gallery for you anything. It just assumes that the module containing the resource is already there. Um, uh, that's the wrong folder, isn't it? Um, yeah, so what I'm doing here, this, the group DSE resource obviously creates local computer groups. So I just do a bunch of stuff on that. And actually the end result is, isn't even that interesting. The, the interesting part is that you can mix and mash this, all the stuff you get from Ansible, like very dynamic variables, you can delegate back and forth. So you can say, so here I'm creating a group on my app server, on my first app server for every single server in my inventory. So you can do really dynamic delegation stuff back and forth, but still using like the DSC ecosystem. So it's pretty powerful. Um, the next one is another Ansible feature. You can use with items, which works as a list or an array. So instead of creating three of these, I'm just saying uh, do this thing uh, once for, for these three. So that just, that's a way of just compacting your playbooks a little bit. Um, so that's, yeah, it's still working, but as you can see, it's going about its business. And also, like I said, it's, it's, it's a little bit slow because we're using DSC and, and the LCM kind of takes a little while to spin up. But, um, but yeah, it, it works really well, actually. There's one caveat with DSC. If your DSC module takes really complex object types, and some of them do. Like I know the IIS module takes a uh, win binding blah, blah, blah information like a rich object. And you also have some DSE resources that take uh, some weird data type as objects. We're not able to properly parse all of those. So you just need to make sure you test. Um, but yeah, uh, that's pretty much all I had time for. I'm, I'll be around. So if you guys want to know more or anything, then just ping me out in the hallway or or whatever. Do we have Do we have time for questions, or do I need to run? No. 
Any more questions? No, no. I, I take that as a good thing. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your time. Cheers. <laughs>